Hey, how's it going? I have two types I haven't done in my pre-evolved runs. Dragon only has one option, and while Electric does have two choices, I'm gonna be honest with you guys and the fact that I think Voltorb could be about Zubat levels of bad, so let's not do that to ourselves today. Instead, we'll be taking a look at the humble beginnings of Pikachu, back when it was a little more round, didn't quite work on its figure as much, and before it was thrust into the spotlight of being the mascot for the biggest media franchise in the entire world. Guys, never forget Chubby Pikachu. No matter how many decades pass, don't forget where you come from. I've told myself I was going to cut down on my intro time, so here's me attempting that. As far as Pikachu goes, I don't really have high hopes for it. It looks like it's going to have a slow start, it doesn't have much going for it in the way of coverage moves, and it could be a long day in the proverbial office for me today. But on this channel, I like to always be positive and keep an open mind, so I'll give Pikachu the best attempt I can, and we'll see how it stacks up in the ever-growing tier list. The rules for the run are in the description if you are new, or if you you just need to be reminded and I'd quickly like to say that I do solo runs fairly often and if that is of interest to you consider subscribing to the channel likes and comments go a long way to help small channels burst into that YouTube algorithm so more people can see the videos and we can just grow as a community and if you're someone who never interacts or just never bothers commenting do me a solid scroll down and just type in cheeky below so I know that I'm not just talking to myself into the abyss and with that out of the way sit back relax Grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and let's see how perhaps the most popular Pokemon in the universe does in a Generation 1 solo run. Like always, I begin the run by making sure Pikachu has good IVs with a save editor, and for this video, the best name I could come up with is Cheeks for the run. I like it, but if you don't agree or have a better name, let me know in the comments for the algorithm if for anything else. From the very first tutorial battle, let's go over some early problems for Pikachu. The starting moveset is Thunder Shock and Growl. The rival will be using Bulbasaur this run since it resists electric attacks, and the other two starters would ultimately be weak to our attacks by the end of the game, so it's a no-brainer what to choose here. I set up some growls and then I used resisted thundershocks to eventually get this one down and it's not too great but as far as the early game goes this is far from the greatest challenge that we're gonna face. From there it's actually not too bad. I'm saving the optional rival fight for now and we'll come back to that but the struggle for Pikachu in the short term is that I literally can't hurt Brock. There are lots of runs where you just can't beat Brock because you have sucky moves like pound or scratch but since Geodude and Onix are immune to electric attacks this whole segment will revolve around us hitting level 16 for quick attack. It's still not going to be great after that, but it is what it is, and we're going to have to do what we got to do, so let's just get on with it. The bug catchers aren't that bad at all. They don't resist Thundershock, and as far as the Kakuna and Metapods go, they can get as hard as they desire because the fact that Thundershock is a special attack means they are easier than most since I don't have to go into that defense stat. Outside of the forest, I spend all of my money on supplies and potions. Normally, this is where my patented wideout on the junior train strategy would come in to play but guys he has two ground types and I can't hurt his Pokemon either so at the time I thought I was being really big brain and I was feeling great here as I come up with another strategy so I can avoid some wild Pokemon grinding. What I thought I would do is wide out on the optional rival fight after defeating the Pidgey and ride that all the way up to level 16 but the reality is that it's so inefficient and slow that it's not worth it. The Pidgey's very weak and it goes down easy enough but it's only 105 experience. That is more than the Metapods by a good amount, but the problem is how slow it is to lose to Bulbasaur. You end up slowly getting Leech Seated down, and usually it'll just mess around with a bunch of Growls or go for some weak tackles. It takes too long, and I end up just doing it a few times for us. I'll just do the Boomer thing and just defeat Metapods the old-fashioned way. I will say I made a slight mistake in picking the Blue version here. Blue has vastly increased odds of fighting Caterpie and Metapod, and I've talked about stat experience and runs, let's say where I grind Diglets later in the game, but all you really need to know is that Weedle and Kakuna give more beneficial stats like attack and at the end of the day it's such a minor difference that I really didn't care enough to restart on a whole different version but it's worth mentioning for any perfectionist out there that maybe you're trying to replicate the run and that extra attack stat experience might actually help you out a tiny little bit. I do this for what feels like an eternity and after murdering every Caterpie and Metapod to ever exist in Kanto I finally hit level 16 and I get quick attack. Obviously I'm gonna go try Brock immediately 
It's a very slow battle, as you might expect, but I just don't have the stats to skim by this one at level 16. I do manage to get the Geodude down on my first attempt, but I was at 1 HP, so I just reset and leave it at that for now. But ladies and gentlemen, access to quick attack opens up faster grinding via the patented Gym Leader Matt Jr. Trainer wideout once again. It works really well with Pikachu. The strategy for this is just to let the Diglett hurt you into the red since it only knows Scratch because Sentry sometimes struggles with killing you because it'll spam sand attacks over and over. So it's just more efficient to let the Diglett hurt you. And before every other solo run channel starts to pick up this strategy, I want you guys just to know that this is my invention and if you ever see someone else doing it, tell them that Gym Leader Matt's coming for them. I'll have a letter. I'll have my lawyer send them a letter. I'll do it. I do this process until I level up and then I'll try Brock, see if it gets any better and if it's not, I'll rinse and repeat. At level 18, the tries start to feel doable, although it does take quite a lot of resets. Although we'll only be looking at the successful attempts, I do want you guys to know it took me a lot of tries to get to that point. As for the Geodude, it's pretty straightforward as far as strategy goes. I find that going straight quick attacks at the start is the way to go. When Geodude starts to use defense curls, the damage will be very low, so getting in the higher damage now makes more sense. I'll quick attack until it uses its first curl, then I'll growl a few times to get its tackle damage down to 2 damage per use, and then ultimately hope to get some crits. I actually get 3 in a row on the successful attempt. I don't think I've specifically went into detail, but at 90 base speed, Pikachu has about a 17.6% chance to crit, so it's not an impossible feat. At the end of the day, it's slow and it's annoying, but here's how it looks when it goes right. I even use a Thundershock on accident and waste a turn, but we still get by. To be honest, getting by the Geodude without crits really wasn't a problem even at level 17. The problem was surviving with enough HP, and on this attempt, I get by with 29. That was the best I could ever manage. Onyx strategies are always the same. If you have a Pokemon with non-damaging moves, you use those in the bad turns, and you get your damage in when you can. I will say that Onyx takes such a small amount of damage from Quick Attack, and even a crit doesn't do a whole lot. Sometimes Onyx can just decide to set up a Screech and then just go for 38 tackles in a roll, but I get very fortunate here, and I get passed. I get a lot of bides. Alright, now that what is probably the worst part of the run is out of the way, what's Pikachu's time? Well, we're sitting here at 1 hour and 24 minutes. I'm not going to say that's great by any means, but we have seen several runs do worse, and honestly, this is probably a little better than what I expected, so we'll, let's, let's move on. From there, you can count the amount of battles that are predominantly ground type on one hand, and that's pretty great for Pikachu since it's what Pikachu's going to struggle with the most. I don't know if anyone thought about this, but you might wonder why I didn't do this on yellow version since I did Eevee on yellow version. The first half of the game would be much easier, and Pikachu gets some additional moves, and you might think that an easier Brock fight might entice me to go that route, but ultimately I decided against it because the latter half of Pokemon Yellow is tougher in several late game areas, specifically ground type trainers. Late game Giovanni fights would be an absolute nightmare for Pikachu, but focusing on the now, let's not think that far ahead. I just thought some of you might wonder why I didn't do the version literally based off of Pikachu where it follows me around, and that's why. As far as all these trainers go, none of them resist electric types, and with the extra leveling required to get past Brock, it's a pretty easy time. As far as Mount Moon goes, I'm trucking through it as fast as I can. I make another minor mistake here, and I talk about the significance soon enough, but I'd skip Mega Punch. The thought behind it is that Quick Attack fills that same niche, and I would be getting Body Slam shortly after, so I just wouldn't need it. But let's skip ahead to Cerulean, because I feel like this opening segment has went on quite a while, but that's because it was such a struggle, and you're slowly going to start to see that change as the run starts to get kind of easy for a pretty long stretch of time. But first up is Rival number 2, because I still think it'll be easier than Misty even though we have a fantastic matchup against her. This is one of the first runs outside of maybe the Egg Bone, Cubone run where it wasn't even listening to us, but we have super effective damage on Pidgeotto. And you guys know how this fight goes. If you trivialize Pidgeotto, the rest of the fight is going to be smooth, and this is no exception. It's not bad at all. It's very quick. It's very easy. We can move on very swiftly. Now for the significance of not getting Mega Punch. Now let's take a look at this son of a bitch hacker with uh, the single Onyx here. It's got me flustered. I can barely talk. This fight is a slow slog and an awful battle, but it drains nearly all of my quick attack PP. So you still might wonder why not getting Mega Punch is a mistake. And here's why. Because I need to get Seismic Toss and the efficient part of my brain wants it right now. And to do that, you have to fight this other hacker that has multiple Geodudes. And I simply don't have enough PP left to get through it. I went through everything in my mind, everything I could look up, everything I could try to do, and I just couldn't do it. There's nothing I can do. You have to
to get this second trainer to walk up so you can get behind him since we don't have cut yet. And at the end of the day, I concede seismic toss for now. And unfortunately, we'll have to come back here later. But it's not that big of a deal. I just really wanted to do it now. I finish up the route and that takes us to Misty. I think this fight would have been easily doable before rival number two. But since we held off and now we have extra levels, it's just that much better. I do take some damage and potentially something like a bubble beam crit could have taken me out. But we don't have to find out. I take this one on the first shot. There's not much strategy here other than electricity is bad for water types. Skipping ahead to the SSN, I do grab Body Slam and I replace Growl. I also pick up the rare candy guarded by the gentleman and I immediately go over to rival number three. In this fight, I take a single sand attack, one sand attack, and you would think that it wouldn't be too bad, but I swear to God, this is the most annoying attack in the entire game. This battle inspired me to look up the evasion dropping mechanics and the math behind it and from my research a single sand attack would drop a 100% accurate move down to 75% a second would drop it down to 60% so on and so forth we don't have to get into that 75% I did find some studies that kind of differ on that advice but I haven't dug into the code for myself so we're just gonna say 75% 75% it's not too bad but I do miss once against the Pidgeotto but the real thing that almost made me rage is that I missed two straight body slams on Kadabra and I almost failed this fight I kept playing it out rather than just rage quit and I actually squeaked out a win here. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The TLDR is that sand attack pisses me off. I see the SSN off and from there, it's time for surge. Being the same type means I'll resist the electric moves and with body slam, I'm confident that I can just outpace everything that he'll throw at me. I demolished the first two Pokemon as expected, but what I didn't expect was just how much resisted damage a Thunderbolt would do from Raichu. I didn't heal before the fight and two of them got me pretty low, but at the end of the day it's a pretty free fight the important part is that we get access to thunderbolt i replaced thundershock instead of thunder wave which isn't optimal but i'm about to replace it anyway so it's not a big deal but i am excited for my first experience with a stab thunderbolt now that i have access to cut and the bike now is the best time to backtrack to get seismic toss since we had to skip it a little bit ago it is extra time but since we can dig from bill's house afterward it's not too bad and this move is absolutely critical to having success and Pikachu's tougher challenges that lie down the road. Looking ahead at Rock Tunnel, I figured taking a look at the hiker with the two Geodudes and a Graveler is worth mentioning. It's one of the handful of ground battles left and this is the main reason that we need Seismic Toss. It does our level in typeless damage, which is key considering that Body Slam is not stabbed and resisted and Thunderbolt just can't damage them. With that said, the first time one of the Geodudes has a critical hit self-destruct and that just takes us out. The second attempt, I actually do manage to get by, but I think luck was the main thing to thank for that. I take a heavy self-destruct to the face once again and I'm all the way down at 7 HP going into the Graveler. Thankfully it misses its move and since I went first, two seismic toss at level 30 is enough to two shot it. Moving ahead once again, let's pick back up in Celadon. I do the usual busy work but I do pick up two proteins to slightly help our damage out for some of the upcoming sections with the majority of the money I have and then I continue on. By far the easiest option available to me right now is the rocket hideout so I head there. Before the grunt that drops the lift key, there is an HP up below him and I pick it up. I normally don't do this, but it's something that I should since it takes barely any time, so I thought I'd mention it here. After minimum battles, we reach our next predominantly ground type trainer in the form of the first Giovanni fight. I've already talked about Seismic Toss, but it really is a lifesaver for this run. A random thought is that there is special promotions that did give Pikachu in Generation 1 access to Surf and Fly, but specifically Surf would make it a pretty dominant Pokemon, but that's not Neither here nor there, just something to think about like the Cubon run. Back to the battle, I actually do almost lose here, but surprisingly it had nothing to do with the ground types. Kangaskhan is a menace and Comet punches me all the way down to 3 HP before I barely squeak by. The big thing is that I learned agility after the fight at level 33. It's a badge boosting move and that's always significant for a run and I get rid of quick attack for it. Afterwards I'm not brave enough to fight Erica just yet so rival number 4 will have to do. Thunderbolt is a little overkill on the Pidgeotto and the Gyarados. And with the level advantage, no one is surprised to see that this is a very trivial battle. The rival does call me a stinker after I beat him and that kind of hurts my feelings a little bit. There is another HP up in Pokemon Tower below the Elixir and just like the Rocket Hideout one, I do pick that one up as well. 
I finish up the tower, I get the Poke Flute, and I decide to try my luck against Erica. I accidentally challenge the female cool trainer, and if you need any video evidence of how broken Generation 1 rap is, I get paralyzed with a stun spore earlier in the fight, and despite this Weeping Bell having next to no HP, it's able to rack lock me down forever until I have to reset, and that's just pretty annoying to say the least. I do try Erica after, I immediately get poisoned, and I get hit with the dreaded guaranteed Razor Leaf crit, but Pikachu surprisingly tanks it well. Although I do progress, the Tangela just stalls me enough to the point to where I'm trying to desperately set up some agilities, but the poison damage is too much, I have to reset. I fail again, and rather than just give up completely, I decide that I'll quickly grind out all the trainers in her gym. I have some antidotes here and there, I have to use them, but overall it's just easy experience and I do get a couple of levels out of it. Now that I'm slightly stronger, I return to face Erica once again. I think Body Slam would be a two shot on the Victory Bell at this level, but I do crit it, but it's not enough for a one shot steal. It goes for just a wrap, and while it's one of the most annoying moves to exist, I still outspeed it and I take it out once that's done. Making it out of the victory matchup not poisoned and healthy means that I have the luxury to be safe here and set up some agilities to allow me to sweep through the Tangela and the Vile Plume without too much hassle. And although it takes me several attempts and required me to level up, I'm glad that this one's over for now. From there, it's down to Fuchsia, and something I rarely have mentioned and is pretty much consistent throughout all my runs is that Fuchsia is the one mandatory time that you need to actually visit a PC to store your items. Key items like the fossil, the SS ticket, the first couple of HMs, or whatever other key items can now be put away. And this is the part of the run where your bags are either already full or they're really close to it. Moving on to Koga, and you would think with him not resisting Thunderbolt, this fight wouldn't be too bad. What ends up happening is the Muck starts the train by doing some obscene damage. And after the second coughing, I'm poisoned, I'm barely hanging on. And honestly, the wheezing goes for a rather disrespectful self-destruct and that's the first reset. I don't really change up the strategy for the second attempt, but I am successful. The one real reason for this is just, it's luck. The Muck goes for a disable rather than some damage, and at the end, the Weezing gets an X attack that essentially skips its turn. Couple that with it not using self-destruct, and I actually squeak by, but I barely escape with the victory here. Having all those things go my way and still almost dying to a neutral matchup didn't leave me feeling great about the more pressing battles that lie still ahead. I pick up the final HM of the run and from there, Sifco is one of the only places left to turn. This is where the Pokey Boys become Pokemon, so let's put Pikachu to the test. Outside of grabbing the rare candy on the 10th floor and clearing the way to the bed for a quick little nap, I don't do anything else extra and I head straight for rival number 5. The first attempt actually isn't that bad. I'll spare you the play by play, but I was really close to rage resetting here. I get hit with not one, but two sand attacks at the start of the fight and the anger started to set in, but I persevered. I do actually progress all the way to the end of the fight, but a key miss here or there means that I take just a little too much damage and I just don't have the juice for the Venusaur. And you would think that that would be a promising start, but I try several more times and more often than not, the results are always the same. The Venusaur is just really tough to overcome and a razor leaf is always a death sentence. The main problem is that I go from level 42 to 43 after the Alakazam, so there's no hope of retaining badge boost from earlier in the fight that would more or less help me out. I have no choice here but to manipulate my experience, so I do have to go grind a few grunts so that I can make sure I don't level up at an inopportune time, so let's see how that works out for us. With my experience set up, let's do a play by play here. First up is Pidgeot, I'll level up so there's no need to set up anything, and a single Thunderbolt is easily enough to one shot it and move us on. I then level up to 44, and Gyarados is next. It's 4 times weak to Thunderbolt, and honestly it just feels great to one shot Gyarados, and I love watching this footage back. Growlithe is next, and this is the critical spot for the battle. Having just leveled up means that I can set up fully, and rather than damage me, the Growlithe actually helps me out with some leers, so by the time I'm done with this matchup, I'm extremely boosted, going into the usual problematic parts of the fight. Alakazam is next to last, and with its frail defense and our boost, it's an easy one shot, and I'm still at full health going into the Venusaur. This is looking great. I do outspeed it, and a Body Slam looks to be doing slightly less than half of its health, and I get the Paralysis proc. It then goes for a Razor Leaf, and once again, let me praise Pikachu on how well it tanks it. It does a nice chunk of damage, but it's really not that bad. A second Body Slam fails to knock it out, and it goes for a Poison Powder, and then I take it out on the next turn with another Body Slam. Honestly, this fight wasn't too bad. 
but I did need to manipulate experience, which honestly is an expected thing when you're using a Pokemon reliant on the badge boosting move. Overall, getting by in a few attempts isn't the worst thing as we've seen in some videos where I have to battle like 54 additional rocket grunts just to get by, so that's pretty good. Now let's take a look at Giovanni number two, and this one isn't bad at all. In fact, the first two Pokemon aren't ground or rock type, so Thunderbolt is just an easy solution. Outside of the Rhyhorn that we have Seismic Toss for, Nidoqueen is the only other ground type on the team. I do take a decent amount of damage and I will say that ground types don't resist body slam so you'll see me trying both out. I do think they're roughly equal but since body slam has an extra effect I probably should have went with that but I don't so let's keep moving on. Next up is Sabrina and although the damage potential from her is always scary this one is really easy. I have great speed and a body slam is enough to get the Kadabra out of the way before it can even get anything off. I do set up on the Mr. Mime and that allows me to easily get through the next two Pokemon and as far as the Alakazam goes, I do outspeed it. Body Slam is not a one shot, but it only sets up Reflect on its turn and a follow up Body Slam takes it out and that's another gym. After a brisk swim down to Cinnabar, I battle all the extra trainers in the gym and after answering everyone's favorite question about Tombstoner brother, it's time for the seventh gym battle. It might surprise you that this fight isn't great if I'm being honest. In the failed attempt here, you'll see that I try to set up on the Ponyta, but I just take too much damage and end up having to reset. There were some more failures, several other failures in fact, but I got unlucky a lot with the burn proc and that extra damage was just too much to overcome. Even when we get to the successful attempt, you'll see that it was very close. I felt it was necessary to set up on the Ponyta so I keep with that same strategy. I drop really low with a super potion here and there and then when the Arcanine misses a move, I do manage to get past. There's not too much strategy here, but honestly it has me feeling a little bit weak. I barely got by this one. And we've seen several runs where Pokemon do alright through the regular gym portion of the game but then we'll see them really struggle at the end when it matters the most and I'm a little worried that's what's going to happen to Pikachu. I don't want another Growlithe or Rhyhorn type of situation but let's just keep optimistic for now. To that end I do spend a little bit of time going back to Celadon to pick up a handful of calciums and a single protein to give myself just that little bit of edge before moving on. I battle all the trainers inside of the last gym and now let's dive into the final Giovanni fight. Simply put this fight ranges anywhere from not great to impossible. The idea is that I would set up on the Rhyhorn and body slams combined with seismic toss would just carry me through the fight. What ends up happening is that I conveniently level up right after the Rhyhorn and losing those boosts is very significant. This means that the paper thin Doug Trio can survive a body slam and it felt like 99 out of 100 times it's just going to go for dig and with its high attack it's just going to rip me in half and one shot me. I try quite a bit and digs are just too much to get past. Even if it does go for a guard spec which is pretty rare, I just can't get the fight down and I have to resort to desperate measures. From there I take a quick stroll to the fighting dojo to get some easy experience. It's easy enough and remember that this isn't about levels, it's about not leveling up at a bad time. I do wipe the floor with these rejects and then I head back to try again. Rhyhorn isn't an issue, it never was. I do set up here and I finish it off the same way I was always able to but let's look ahead. The important and crucial part is that not leveling up lets me keep those attack back boost and with just that little bit of health I could actually one hit the duck trio and the main problem of the fight is solved. And I wouldn't say the rest of the fight is necessarily easy but I do get past on the first attempt. I do take a significant amount of damage but the victory was never really in question. It takes several hits to get through all the remaining Pokemon but Pikachu eventually does overcome one of its hardest obstacles. What's really important and something that I would like to take credit for but I can't is that I luckily perfectly level up to 54 at the end of the fight. And and that's just perfect for rival number six so let's just hop straight into that. I don't think there's a need to do a play by play for this one because we've seen how it plays out. It's pretty much near identical to the rival number five fight. Pidgeot is an easy one shot and with the addition of Rhyhorn that means I now have the opportunity to set up on it. After that my speed is just through the roof and I'm boosted and from there I just cruise to the end of the fight. Venusaur here doesn't go for razor leaves and even though it does take three body slams to take it out still it only goes for two vine whips and it's not close to taking me out and this is another rather easy fight. So at this point I'm pretty conflicted. Some parts of the run have been really tough for Pikachu but then at other times it just dominates really tough fights like it just did with rival number six. Heading towards the league a lot of the battles seem like they are kind of neutral. 
So I really don't know how this one's gonna go. Pikachu has felt really frail during some spots of the run. So I guess my worst fear and the worst case scenario is that I'm gonna run into a roadblock and just have to keep leveling up to get past. I don't want that to happen. I do grab the rare candy in Victory Road and before seeing how it goes, I use all but three of them before Lorelei. This gets me up to level 63. So let's just kind of dive in and see how this is gonna go. And I'm not gonna lie to you guys, this one feels really good. There are just a lot of runs where you're weak to Lorelei and this is your first run in with ice type Pokemon and it can be a really huge hassle. It almost felt cathartic to just be able to thunderbolt everything that moves. I do actually set up on the slow bro just for some added insurance and overall this is just actually one of the easier battles on the run and I'm all for it. There's no need to really dive in deeper or show this fight anymore so let's just keep it moving on. Lorelai's easy. Fantastic. Next up is Bruno and you would think with two rock and ground type Pokemon this one might be a little bit challenging but if you think that you then you haven't watched any of my videos I easily breeze through this fight and the only thing of note is near the end I do take some damage and then Machamp uses a submission it gets me kind of low but not really but overall this is another easy one shot thanks to seismic toss so let's just keep it moving it's, things are going great right now now it's time for Agatha without a sidekick or ground move this one has the potential to be very annoying on the first Gengar I don't want to use Thunderbolt at first because I'm thinking it's special so high and seismic toss isn't quite close enough to get it to half health. I do take a confuse ray and a thunderbolt on the following turn isn't enough to take it out. Despite triggering a super potion I'm still not able to take it out and ultimately I get put to sleep. That means I take a dream eater and the nightshade while I'm taking a nap and things are looking pretty dire but Pikachu does wake up right on time to avoid a lethal dream eater. It turns out to be for nothing because hurting myself from a confuse ray into another nightshade does finish it off and this was about as bad as an act the attempt can go so I'm not really too worried about it. Going back in, I make the adjustment of using Thunderbolt since Seismic Toss can't two shot it anyway. Gengar goes for Hypnosis, it misses, and then I crit on the second Thunderbolt to move past without any struggles. And from there, Golbat comes in, no issues, Thunderbolt is a one shot and it blasts through it. Then the Hunter comes in, I get off a Thunderbolt, it goes for a Confuse Ray, and then I shrug it off to go for a Lethal Seismic Toss. Arbok is next, and since I'm so healthy at this point in the fight, I want to set up Agility to make sure I can make it through the rest of it. I do take some acids. They do some pretty all right damage, but Agatha kind of knows what I'm up to and makes an aggressive swap into the final Gengar. I outspeed it. I crit on the Thunderbolt, but it hangs on. It goes for a Nightshade. And while I am getting a little bit low here, I can finish it off with another Thunderbolt. Our bot comes back in. And at this point, the hardest part of the fight is already over with. And a single Thunderbolt is all that it takes to wrap up this battle. Lance is next. And ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to worry about Gyarados in this run. Just enjoy this footage of me doing enough four times super effective damage to kill Gyarados, Gyarados' children, and its children's children. Moving on. On the first Dragonair, you would think that this would be where I set up, but I didn't use a rare candy prior to this fight because I was really close to leveling up after Agatha. Rather than lose all the experience, I do just keep it, and after some body slams on the first Dragonair, I do level up to level 66 after. Now is the time where I need to set up, and honestly, it doesn't go that great. I'm getting chipped down, but I need these boost. The cherry on top is that a boosted body slam afterward doesn't knock it out in one hit and I take a dragon rage to get me all the way down to 26 HP and things just aren't looking good from here. But with the agility set up, the Aerodactyl isn't an issue. I do outspeed it and a Thunderbolt is an easy one shot. From here, I need the Dragonite to use a non-damaging move to make it pass. Thunderbolt is a two shot and I do get the luck required when it just goes for an agility and that allows me to get by the fight albeit at low health. Now it's time for the champion fight and to keep a long story short I do fail this one a couple of times. The first attempt I take heavy damage from the Alakazam and at the end a Razor Leaf crit is enough to force a reset on the first attempt. The second attempt looks promising but Mega Drain recovers just enough health to survive a second body slam and once again Razor Leaf ends this attempt so let's just jump into the next one. On the Pidgeot I want some speed to be faster than the Alakazam. I do set up one but then it charges up a sky attack and I kind of chicken out and I go for a Thunderbolt because I don't want to take a potential crit. One agility is then enough to outspeed the Alakazam, but Body Slam isn't enough to one shot. It does only set up a reflect on its turn, but it's lost so much health that we can just take it out in the next turn with ease. Rhydon is up next, and I have two more agilities to set up. I do just that, and I even get some help with some additional badge boost, but honestly, Rhydon starts to do some pretty significant damage to me and doesn't really leave me feeling confident after I finally do enough seismic tosses to get past it. As for Gyarados, you know how this one's going to 
gonna go. I blast it. Let's just move on. Arcanine is a two shot, but it does get off some Ember damage to further take my health even lower and easily put me into a Razor Leaf crit range. So let's move on to the moment of truth and see how it plays out. Venusaur comes in. I go first and Body Slam crits to take it slightly below half health. From there, it charges up a Solar Beam and I actually crit for a second time in a row on a Body Slam and that takes the fight. I'm not sure if this crit mattered, but I'll take it regardless. And that's it. Pikachu has done it. And for a Pokemon I started out by saying I don't have high hopes for and expected it to honestly be pretty bad, I'm kind of surprised. So let's take a look. Pikachu finishes with the nicest level in the game at level 69 and beats the game with an end game time of 4 hours and 53 minutes. If we look at the updated tier list, that's actually tied for the exact time that Charmander beat the game in, except Pikachu did it 3 levels earlier. This means that Pikachu will take over that number 10 spot, and that's kind of a shocker. I expected Pikachu to take significantly longer, but after Brock, there were only a few battles that were even a struggle. I had to level up on Erica, and then I had to go manipulate my experience on both rival number 5 and the final Giovanni fight, but outside of that, it was pretty solid. Even the Elite 4 had very few resets, I think 3 total. I guess looking back, a Pokemon that has a very solid stab move like Thunderbolt that's very useful during the Elite 4, along with a badge boosting move and agility, and having Body Slam which is one of the best general moves, it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise that we're sitting here with this time. Seismic Toss is really what holds the run together, it's that glue, and in my opinion, and overall, I do think it was a pretty good run. There are some optimizations I could have done, like getting Mega Punch early, then picking up Seismic Toss instead of having to backtrack for it, and planning my experience better for fights where I need those boosts, but at the end of the day, I don't see myself being able to save more than 5 or 10 minutes at most, and I'm not going to redo the run over just to see, and I'm happy with what we got. I expected a pretty bad run today, and after we have just been doing some really top tier runs, they've been all bangers, we actually ended up just getting a middle tier run today, and I'm, I'm fine with that. But that's about all I have for you guys today. I have a bunch of things that I want to do eventually, but I'll get to them when I get to them. I have a list. Some people have requested stuff. I just haven't quite got to it. But anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week, and I'll catch you guys on the next video. Bye!